Okay, so first uh, first off, let me welcome our panelists. Uh, we're just going to kind of go uh, clockwise. First, we have Jonathan Liu. Jonathan is uh, the revenue leader of GLH Hotels. Um, and then we have Alessandro Crotti, who is um, – or Jonathan, I tell you what, let's do that. Actually, or okay, let's do it this way. Uh, Alexander Crotti, who's a revenue expert with Direct Your Bookings, uh, mm -hmm. who happens to be coming from us from uh, quite a distance away in Thailand today. And then uh, we have uh, Sylvia with us. So let's get a picture of Sylvia. Sylvia Cantarella uh, with Revenue Acrobats, also another um, uh, revenue expert at a company that helps hotels uh, make more money. So uh, let's let's start talking. Right, this is all about how do we get ourselves ahead of the curve. We, 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 uh, I'm going to share some uh, some STR data in a minute. Uh, it's something that, um, I, as I made the shift from being a revenue manager to a professor, all of a sudden the things that my boss would walk into my office and go, why are you wasting time on that? Now they're part of my job. Uh, but it's kind of the geeky thing to sort of look at some of the metrics and, and, and all that once in a while. And so um, I, I'm going to share that with you, but I think it'll be, it'll be really interesting to take a look at that, right? And then let's have a discussion about what's around What's going to happen with COVID? How do we see the recovery? Um, so Enzo, if you don't mind, share, share those slides real quick and we'll, we'll take a look. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that are webinar consumers, uh, this next slide, I'm sure you've seen. Uh, this is from uh, directly from STR and it goes all the way back to 1990. And the reason I wanted to share that is this is not our first downturn. If you take a look at the far right hand side, it's our biggest one, but it's not the first one. And if you look at those circles, you'll see that those downturns are always followed by a period of growth. And they're characterized pretty, they're, there's some pretty similar characteristics. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more. If you go to the next slide, Enzo, uh, this is a little bit in, more in depth research. This happens to be based on Switzerland. And this is, uh, I showed you those cycles. This happens to be the 2001 cycle, which started with uh, the September 11th a terrorist event in New York City, and then was kind of piggybacked with SARS, which was one of the first global pandemics that we saw. And if you take a look at Switzerland, we saw the immediate decline in occupancy. And what you're looking at is trailing 12 month occupancy and average rate change. So you see the occupancy immediately de decline, no surprise, the occupancy immediately declined for most of us, February, March, or April. You see in Switzerland, a lagging impact that the average rate continued to grow. And that's something that you'll see in a lot of these downturns. We lose the occupancy, then the average rate comes down. And then as you watch the markets recover, then the average rate recovers. So uh, as you'll see from September 11th, it took 77 months for the Swiss hospitality industry, specifically upper and upscale and upper upscale and upscale to get back to what they were before it. But if you take a look at the slope of those lines, typically the decline is always characterized by this big growth period afterwards. So jump to the next one, Enzo, if you don't mind, just to show a similar illustration. Uh, this one is now the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And if you look, Switzerland still has not fully recovered to the 2008 high watermark in the industry because our economy is super dependent upon the international financial service companies. And so we haven't really recovered. But if you take a look, you still see this rapid recovery and you always see occupancy than average rate. So take a look at uh, the next one. This is now the current situation in Switzerland. So roll one more for me, please, if you don't mind. And now the red line is the current, that's the present. So you can see very big decline. You can see the blue is the occupancy change. It fell very rapidly. The average rate lags behind. And from the red line forward though, what I've done is really geeky professor stuff, but the bottom line is a forecast. And what you can see is probably that same sort of six years in Switzerland to recover. But if you look at the slope of the rev part line, it's frothy, it's, it's an amazing time. So. Uh, one more slide, Enzo, it's the last one. Um, if you look at what happens, it's always very consistent that after the downturn, there's amazing opportunities. So not the best time to own hotels, but what I would tell you is you're literally sitting at the precipice of an unprecedented time to be involved in filling hotels and working in hotels. If you take a look at those orange circles, every single one of those disruptions is followed by something big in our business. And so we're gonna talk about what this new disruption might mean. But the first one is the time period when revenue management kind of started to come into being. The industry is really strong, oh, we get hurt, we respond, and that's when my career took off, okay? You go a little further, there's another decline, September 11th, things start to take off. That's when the online travel agencies revolutionized our industry, right? We were doing great, the industry fell, they had business for us, we took it, and <laughs> now we have that. 
The next cycle, very similar, the financial crisis, the main innovation after that was data products. And many of you that have been in the business for a little while, this is when rate shopping tools started to proliferate. This is when we first started to hear about channel managers. So every single one of these downturns has this period, first of all, of growth for those of us that work in the business and also really cool innovation that takes place because we're in a time period of need. And if you look at the time period that led up to COVID, it's actually the longest time period of sustained growth that the industry's had in a long time. And so it only stands to reason that when we come out of it, we're gonna have tailwinds like we've never had before. So I wanted to share that really more than anything else to set the tone. This is not a funeral, if anything. This is kind of like a, uh, a baby shower, if you will. We don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but in the very near future, we're all gonna have new stuff to deal with. We're all gonna be sleepless and, and all those things. So um, I'd like to just kind of throw it out there. And if you don't mind, Jonathan, I'm gonna start with you. So based on that information, I know you know this stuff, right? We've all lived in this because owners keep asking us, when is it gonna get better? And so far, the only answer we have is not yet. Um, but what's your outlook on the recovery and, and all that? I'm seeing this as really quite positive. I mean, when we look at some of our stats around search demand, there are so many people wanting to go on holiday, wanting to travel at the moment for London and particularly the UK, where we're just held up because of the government restrictions, not, not allowing us to, to operate. So as soon as we can open our doors, we can see that it's going to start coming through and, and that recovery will be led firstly by domestic because of the, the international flows that are, are restricted, but primarily the leisure, the leisure customer. We've been locked up for so long. We just want, we want to go and have an experience. We, we want to be back out in hospitality. Excellent. Yeah, I, it's interesting you, you mentioned um, domestic. I'm sure that'll come up sort of what is the is an obvious order that things are gonna come back that we've all pretty much agreed upon, which means some hotels are gonna enjoy next year and some hotels are gonna enjoy 2024, unfortunately. Um, but, um, but, but that's definitely a very interesting, very interesting statement. Uh, Sylvia, let me jump to you. Uh, same kind of question, what's your outlook? I mean, you're sitting here right now, um, we're not talking you off the ledge, so you obviously have some optimism. So what are your feelings? Well, yeah, uh, actually, I lived through the crisis of 2008, Scott, so I remember well those times, uh, and I lived also through the recovery following. So I'm quite optimistic as well. I think there will be a great recovery because uh, different from the other crises, there's a lot of pent up demand, as Jonathan said. So people are really looking forward to go back in traveling. And we can see that because as soon as the travel restrictions are lifting, you immediately see demand bouncing back on the, on the short term. And what's different uh, compared to the other crises is that right now we have so much data, intelligence, and new technology, which is really helping us uh, figuring out what's coming next or understanding the new traveler trends. So by leveraging this kind of intelligence and data, we can really make tailor-made offers in order to convert them. So I'm very optimistic that it's still long to go. There's still to run the marathon, but we will see we have a bright future ahead. You you make um, you make an amazing point that we're better equipped, right? We have better understanding. We can see that stuff. Jonathan, you also alluded you see search volume, right, and those kind of things. So we didn't certainly the first downturn that I experienced there was no dot com, so certainly I didn't see search volume. Um, but it's really it's it's an interesting statement that you make, really, uh, Sylvia. That you know when when it starts to come back, right? We have this intelligence, and one of the things that's going to really unfortunately be part of the recovery is not every hotel is going to recover the same, right? The ones that take advantage of things recover first. The ones that don't kind of, they still think it's bad for a while. So um, Alessandra, I saw you nodding. So uh, chime in on that. I mean, tell me a little bit about that. That's a perfect one. Yeah, no, well, I mean, don't expect me to be the pessimistic one so in the sense that I follow the flow and I um, definitely tend to agree the optimistic flow. Um, I mean, there is no doubt whether after this big decline, there is going to be a big climb, but I guess there, are, there is no doubt. Uh, the question eventually is uh, how long it will it take, uh, whether this curve is going to be like a, a big climb, so more likely vertical or a little bit more gentle along the time. But that is actually no doubt. And we have already been seeing this, uh, this data, like Sylvia said, like also Jonathan said, as soon as we have a little bit of a glimpse of a hope, uh, people are getting crazy about traveling. And I mean, we all know traveling now is not just a wish, it's a need. And uh, uh, we are definitely just waiting. People like us, human beings, just waiting for the right conditions for traveling. 
It's just that we don't know exactly how the let's say booking patterns will be. And from that perspective, that is definitely going to be very interesting because, like Sid said, we have a lot of data, but now it's just like the very first day at school. We kind of need to learn from scratch in a certain way. And that's going to be interesting, in my opinion. We will, yeah. That that I'm curious about this. I'm curious to see about what's going to be, and I'm, I think that we're going to face a lot of surprises. <laughs> it's like opening a new hotel. Like yeah, exactly. That's a lot of why. new hotels. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's when you look at Smith Travel data, right? Two hundred and fifteen thousand rooms under construction in March of twenty twenty. So more rooms under construction than ever before. Industry wow. was super solid. Hotels make terrible other buildings, right? Too many toilets to be an office building. So it's going to be a hotel, right? It's just a question of when we recover and 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 bring the business back. So, um, but let me ask you guys. So, so now we're talking about right. It's going to. We know it's going to recover. We know things are. We know things are going to get better. There's no question. It's all. It always has. And there's definitely all this pent up travel and everything. But before all that started to happen, all we were talking about was the experience economy, right? Everything was talking about, um, you know the that you know, it's all, it was all about memories, not possessions. Uh, I think, you know, if you, I hate the term, but if you think about the way we would characterize millennials, if anything, they were teaching those of us that are older that boy, there's a different version of life than, than lots of cars in the garage and, and, and lots of big televisions. So now things have changed, right? We might be in a little moment of the sanitation economy, I think for a little while, but that's gonna end, right? As soon as somebody's gonna make a robot with a laser and everything's gonna get all better. Um, and so how do you guys see that? I mean, what, you know, as we begin to recover, how does personalization start to come back into it all? How, do, how does that take over? So let me start with you, well, so, so, so if you don't mind. Okay. Well, oh, for, oh, for me, okay. Oh, yeah, so actually, mind. I think that uh, actually pandemic brought a boost to personalization because since the pandemic started, we all also started as Atelier talking about how to create great experiences to the guests, uh, deliver value, not to drop on prices, so create really something memorable around it because the competition out there is fierce. Competition is broader than we think. We're not just competing with hotels with hotels right now, but with alternative accommodations and anything because customers' preferences have changed. So there has been a boost, in my opinion, on personalization and again, technology took over because um, when we're talking about personalization, I think we can just not divide the two. So there is the human touch of us being a hospital, being hoteliers. There's technology helping us to, you know, getting rid of non-value add activities in order to really focus our attention on the guests and make really memorable experiences. So I've seen it as a positive thing again. So I think it will continue even more. So do me a favor and build on that a little bit because I'm so, sort of not really, I'm more of a distribution person and that kind of thing. But you mentioned a little bit about just kind of general operations, right? And how can we use some of the, 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 the innovation that's happening in order to take better care of our customers, right? And move forward. What are some examples of that, Sylvia? Share, share an example if you don't mind. Yeah, let's start from the basic live web check-in. Okay, so everybody now is not like a queuing to check in at the hotel. So the customer arrives has already done the web check-in. You can spend that extra minute just to really engage with the guests and not just asking documents and information, which is something that the technology is taking uh, taking part. Or let's uh, think about, you know, digital concierges, for example. So we can now interact with our customers without being physically present, but uh, shortening the distance through technology. And again, it's not impersonal in a way, but it's uh, helping us to do our job better. And we can really be more present while they are on property. Sure. I, when I teach digital marketing, I use the term curating the digital customer journey. We used to think of that as getting them in the front door. But now, as you mentioned, right, it's a lot of it's, it can be mid stay. And certainly we've all kind of found the holy grail of digital marketing is loyalty. Right. We can get loyalty. We don't have to pay to get them in the top of the funnel next time. It's a much better, a much better process. How about you, Alessandra? What kind of what, what kind of you know automation are you seeing that's going to affect us when, when we emerge? Well, I mean, uh, consider these times, uh, uh, COVID-19 and during this full year, more than full year, <laughs> other than running my own business, I decided to jump onto another opportunity, which is just about this. So the Gauvendi system is a retail system which uh, doesn't do anything but just uh, providing the experience that customers and prospects are looking mm -hmm. for. And uh, I mean, I always refer to, I, I guess it was the um, the CEO of Citizen Amotels, uh, 
who mentioned that the hotellerie is probably the reddest ocean of all, like red, red, the color red, meaning the, the color of the blood, so the color of a competition, all right, as opposed to the blue ocean. Mm-hmm. And I really mean it, I really believe in it because the hotellerie is probably, hotels are probably the most commoditized items across all sectors, across all industries. And we cannot go on like that. I mean, that's the reason why the big guys like that, like I used to call them, so booking.com, Expedia, but nothing against the OTAs, but that's why they strive essentially. And I really believe that either we need to change these kind of patterns and we have to kind of make a step forward in order to provide something that is not just about standard room. Because if I ask you, what does a standard room mean? I guess you cannot answer that, right? I mean, what, what does it mean? <laughs> By the way, some, sometimes, you know, deluxe and superior, superior and deluxe, right. like that's it. The, one I of mean, those exactly. There are there is no there are no specific amenities that define a specific room type, and yet we still kind of try to sell the same room to the same product. I mean, our rooms, our hotels, our product. But how can we change the way we sell our products? More likely, people. I mean, I've worked at the front desk of many hotels, right? So because yes, now I'm a tech guy, but I used to. I, I was born as a revenue manager. I also be a front office manager, and I've been on that side of the bench. Let's put it this way. And I know. At I mean, now there are not many uh, customers flowing in, but I know how many people ask for just a very simple thing like. Uh, hotel that is on a higher floor as opposed to far away from the elevator those are the things eventually people might be interested in as opposed to a standard room what does a standard room mean and that is uh, ultimately what we are trying to do i mean of course it's a uh, it's a big a big 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 uh, you know change in the mindset and how we approach uh, the sale of our products meaning our hotels but i think it's quite positive and i think people are gonna like it a lot and the first uh, feedback that we're getting is quite quite promising, I have to be honest. Totally agree. So, so Jonathan, look, I want to slightly shift gears for you only because you have a little bit different perspective. You have a responsibility for a portfolio. So you have a branded booking engine that you're responsible for. So what kind of, what, what kind of decisions are you making about that? I mean, you know, we've heard the term attribute-based booking. We've heard some of the stuff that Alessandro was alluding to, but I mean, you have to prioritize it and pay for it, and it's not the most lucrative time in the business. So how do you make those decisions? How do you balance all that stuff? Well, we took a very drastic approach and we ripped everything apart. We, we looked at our tech stack. We realized we had some amazing products, but none of them really talked to each other. So what we've done in the last 12 months is <coughs> rebuilt our entire tech stack with a brand new website, a new booking engine, new RMS, and that's all coming together in a new seamless environment that connects directly with our PMS through to our CRM, right through our customer in real time. And it, there's lots of tiny things that you can do at a hotel level just in terms of your content as well. So redesigning your content to make it more appropriate to the customers that you're targeting. Um, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about our customer, so much so that we've actually decided to rebrand two of our hotels and introduce a brand new brand launching into the market next month based on the customers that are out there rather than just building a a hotel and hoping some customers come to us. We've really taken a very customer centric approach to this and it's it's coming together really well and really excited to to welcome this new brand to to our customers very soon. That's really Do you mind if I ask sorry do you mind if I ask you Jonathan because you mentioned uh, 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 new website uh, with new content. Uh, uh, if I may ask, uh, what kind of content? I mean, is that like descriptive content about the hotel? Is that uh, uh, content about the, your locality, your location, or what kind of content? Yeah, we've rewritten a lot of our content just to try and focus on on what the customers are looking for. So previously, you might be talking about your hotel being close to a train station or, or having access to corporate uh, office blocks. But that's not who the customer is and what they're looking for now. They're probably looking for we're across the road from a park, we're an easy walk uh, to an attraction. And just using a different language that the customer really will respond to because that's what they're looking for. The world has changed and and so must we. You're making my day, I have to say. (laughs) Mine too. Mine too, thank you. (laughs) I mean, when I I really, because I mean, it it, it may sound obvious, but most of, very often, too, too often actually, it's not so obvious. Like, 
really put the customer at the very center of whatever you do in content. I mean, you do content not because of your ego, but because of customers may be interested in it. And uh, yeah, thank you for saying so. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the marketing uh, cusp piece in a little bit, right? Because the customization is two things. It's customizing our product and then it's really customizing our message, right? How do we get a message out that is that, you know, there's all these great opportunities to really micro target, right? And so is personalization the internet cookies and the creepy thing where we get up, you know, we dig around in people's houses at night and figure out what they like or is personalization understanding social media really well and understanding the, what people look at and creating things for people that are already looking for things, right? So there's kind of, there's definitely some couple of directions that could go and and uh, maybe at some point we'll get into the discussion about cookies, but Google has been signaling that cookies are going away for a very long time, but Google makes a lot of money with cookies. So they're not gonna go away until somebody comes up with a replacement for cookies. So it, there's a whole thing, that is, there's always gonna be that opportunity to personalize that way. But I don't know about you guys, I hate being stalked around the internet with banner ads. It doesn't work, I don't click on them. Um, it bothers me in fact. And so um, so I think that there's a there's personalization that people are gonna like that's got value to them. And there's personalization that we're going to think because there's the technological capability, we should do it as a marketer. And I really hope that consumers, like if enough people watch The Social Dilemma, there may actually be consumer pushback that says, Stop digging through my drawers to figure out if I'm a hiker. If I'm a hiker, I, go to hashtag.com, go to, go to hashtag hiker and talk to me, right? So, so there's a lot of different versions that, that can take, which is really interesting. I mean, and, and so, you know, you, you guys all mentioned seeing traffic and stuff, and, and we'll definitely talk about that in a second. But so, so customization is coming, right? And, and the, um, the understanding of our customers coming. And I think to some of us, like I like personalization if I've asked for it. I, I like frequent traveler programs. I like that they know me. I like that the gift is beer, not wine, because I drink beer, not wine. You know, so so I mean, I think some of that's really, really beneficial. And then, in a way, it's using technology to enable us to become innkeepers again. Because when people ran twenty room inns and the Johnsons always came for Christmas week, the manager was standing there going, "Oh, you've grown so much!" Like there was that level of personalization about the family. And we'd gotten away from that a little bit, and now we're kind of getting back to it. So I actually, I'm with you, Alessandro. I think it's it's back to being an innkeeper, which which um, you know it gets in our blood, right? I, I, I was in the commercial side. I was not in a hotel for the last 15 years. I was in the business, but when people come to visit us, my wife and I still put two waters on the nightstand because I think once you're yeah. in, you're an innkeeper, you're an innkeeper, you know. So that's really cool, super cool. Let's um let's shift gears a little. Actually, let me ask you one other question. You mentioned the stack. Right, and, and cloud computing has given us this really cool ability to basically not go to an automobile dealer and buy a car and have it fit our needs, but if we have the wisdom to do it, we get a, a shopping list, we go to an auto parts store and we assemble our own car, right? We could put together exactly the components that work best for us in a stack, but it takes skills to do that. And you mentioned technology that doesn't talk, Jonathan. So I wonder if you just kind of, like not all APIs are created equal, right? Not all technology connects at the same level. So would you mind just, Kind of building on that and then i'm gonna ask uh, alessandro and, and uh sylvia i'm gonna ask you the same thing because i know you guys run into this all the time right cleaning up people's tech so what, what was that what was involved in that i mean the connection part what was really important is from a, a customer experience that there's a, a seamless journey and we weren't able to to provide that because you would have one 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 piece of uh uh journey handled by one system then as you check in, there'd be another system and we weren't actually moving the right data between all those systems. So we were asking a customer maybe the same question three times, even though they've told us that information already. So looking at the, the types of opportunities out there with technology and making sure that it matched, firstly, the customers that we were attracting and wanting to attract. And secondly, that it worked with our other operational systems. For some of the, the systems we've taken, it's been really more about how will this integrate to our existing systems rather than getting what is best in class? And, and that makes a huge difference. If you can get that efficiency and that productivity through your journey, the customer will feel that it's, that it's easy. And if the customer feels that's easy, their propensity to pay a little bit more is, is there. Yeah, I mean, if you think about um, the whole concept of the abandoned shopping cart, if you have a not very seamless process, 
I might get, you know, I might, I might finish in book, but if it takes a long time, I might get interrupted and I may never come back. So, so yeah, I think you want to make sure that that, that part's smooth. So now Jonathan has the benefit of a much more controlled environment, but Sylvia and Alessandra, I know you guys kind of work with a lot of different folks, right? So tell me, I mean, there's a lot of technological innovation and not a lot of new solutions. Some of the ones that are really cool, uh, for example, some of the revenue management solutions that are newer are more simple than the ones that have existed for a long time, right? They're kind of targeted at different parts of the business. So tell me you know, a little bit of, in terms of that technology for hotels. How are you guys, like what technology is cool that you're really jumping into right now? Um, what technology are you finding is kind of getting antiquated and there's a new version? I mean, how's that working? So Sophie, if you don't mind that, tell me first. But what, yeah, you know, I know you have to undo that a lot, so. I love technology and I have to say it's amazing to see how technology evolved post pandemic and also the revenue management systems, the price shoppers all adapted to need to this new normal because if we think how they changed the algorithms and they included the new data that was not included in the past, for example, research is travel intentions, which is absolutely necessary for us right now as revenue managers to understand because that's the only kind of data that let's say it honestly, we can leverage on as long as we don't have enough bookings where to understand demand, we can only leverage and rely on travel intention. Uh, there is uh, revenue management systems, uh, price shoppers, but every kind of technology, I have to say, uh, from my experience, really adapted so well post-pandemic. I'm thinking about, for example, chatbots giving you great insights on where are the customers looking for, or booking engines as well. So every little piece of technology may not be only one piece of technology because it's uh, they are different vendors, but uh, it's part of our job right now as revenue manager, and that's the evolution of our role to just take all the kind of data and information that we have from all these systems and interpret it in order to get a picture of what's going on next and how we can better target and leverage the demand moving forward. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. Alessandro, let me just ask you the same question. Can I get your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, technology is that one topic that most of the time is, makes me kind of itchy sometimes in the sense that, <laughs> and, I, and I'm a tech guy, by the way, but the thing is that, um, I mean, technology is always evolving. I mean, uh, I'm saying something that is totally obvious, but my question or every single time, and this is beyond and besides the pandemic, but have we been using the technology that we already had in our hands to its, full, to its fullest? Uh, but even just a very simple tool, like I always make the example of Google Analytics. I still believe that 95% of the feature in Google Analytics remain unknown to many of yes. And uh, I, I'm just saying so because, I mean, I can make an example of hotel that I uh, just started following. They want to, you know, th their goal, the specific goal is to have more clients looking for longer periods. But then I look into specific data. I start tracking data, look into specific data and say, look, people are not interested in that. However, you are losing opportunities for that. People looking for or searching for, like I say, three nights or four nights, like a huge opportunity. It was a simple report that was looking at me and saying, big opportunity, take me. <laughs> and that I was not seeing. You see, there is not necessarily need of new technology. Most of the times, we might even step back a little bit. I'm not saying that the technology is bad, but okay. I mean, before moving forward, it's like the problem of big data. Also, big data makes me kind of itchy at times because, yes, a big data is super cool. I love data and data is super, super, super useful. But numbers don't lie. There's a saying that said that numbers don't lie, but they're so easy to misrepresent. And I keep seeing so many times uh, falling into the trap of being misled by wrongly interpreted data. So how do we do that? Because probably in that sense, uh, we don't necessarily need uh, more technology. Probably we need to better use the technology that we already have. Yeah, I mean, you, it's it, this goes all the way back for a long time, right? Many of us are familiar right. with AI and some of those kind of systems, and so we would spend a tremendous amount of money. We would do, we would put people in the banquet space. We would do all this training. We'd roll out Delphi. We were amazing. Six months later, they have a little bit of turnover. Some of that training would walk out the door. Two years later, Delphi is a glorified content management system or, or contact management system. We're not using it for anything else because you get that atrophy of skills because it, it, it maybe wasn't the right thing in the first place. And I think, it, as you mentioned, Sylvia, sometimes it's finding the right 
level of technology the best one you don't deliver pizza with a ferrari yeah. right and so it's, it's right and it's, and it's and it's so much a matter of educating people about how about right. what's the use of technology and how to read data because uh, i think we're still lagging a bit behind sometimes in some um, from in some markets and it's all about education when people understand the value how you can read that kind of data and how you can apply it to your strategy and use it then they complete their perception is completely reverted so yeah i I, I kind of agree with Alessandro in the sense that yes, there's a lot of technology, but we should start making a better use of the technology that we already have because I think that most of the times we are using it at 20 or 30 percent of its potential. Because yeah, if, if I may add to it, oh, sorry, no. okay, no, if I may add to it, the, the perception that I have, and I'm not judging, but the perception that I have is that when it comes to technology, we look into technology as something that makes our life necessarily easier. But technology is not all the times easy in the sense that we need to put forth the effort to make use of it. Like, I mean, in the sense of data, for example, data, we need to kind of learn. It's a learning process of how to read and interpret it and how to turn the numbers into actionable items. It's not something that we own. Okay, we see a number and we already know how to do it. And this is probably where there is a little bit of friction, right? So we, we love to probably as human beings, I guess, because this is not just a problem of our industry, I guess it's a problem of our, you know, species, <laughs> that we, we like to play easy, too easy sometimes, <laughs> and we are not kind of ready to, <laughs> you know, to push forward. And we easy. think that technology will do the magic, well, actually it does not, because it's always right. a combination of us as human working with and feeding technology the right way. I agree. Um, so, okay, I just was just got a, a, a question from someone that I took a look at. So I completely agree, right? It's, it's about the right technology. It's about understanding your operation and finding technology that helps you be better, not that changes your business rules, unless you want to change your business rules. We often see that, you know, that, and, and, uh, and, and, and so people make the commitment to technology sometimes because of which technology was the, which technology vendor was the most persuasive vendor, not based on kind of which tool would best fit their fit their need. So let's, I tell you what, I'm going to, I want to jump a little bit. And we started talking about, um, we started talking about personalization and everything, but let's make a little bit of a move, right? We all know that every, the way we do business has changed forever. Um, and, you know, for us, and certainly in the revenue side, one of the biggest things is our history is garbage, right? Pretty much everyone knows you got to throw away your history, or certainly you have to apply some sort of filter to it to, to make, to, to make decisions. Now, it kind of doesn't matter very much right now, because most hotels are sort of in the mode of taking everything they can get their hands on. But eventually that's going to get better. It's not always going to be this way. So how, I mean, this is kind of ahead of the curve question. How can hotels sort of make sure that their business processes will allow them to stay ahead of the curve? How can, how can they not see the recovery in the form of their competitors' parking lots being full? Let me ask you that way. So uh, I, I tell you, uh, go ahead, Alessandro, you start first. I feel, I feel like a teacher. I start first. No, I mean, um, let me put it this way. I mean, this is the moment where even though the uncertainty reigns in the sense that, okay, we still cannot plan too much in advance because the situation is still, is still of course, uncertain. Um, what I keep saying, because I really and literally keep saying is that people maybe cannot travel, but the, they cannot and they have never stopped dreaming about traveling. And if you think about, I mean, strictly from a marketing perspective, the, the classic funnel starts with the unawareness phase and then dreaming phase and then planning and then booking. By far, the dreaming phase is the best phase to start marketing to people. And this is why I keep saying that this is the perfect moment, but not necessarily now, I probably were already late, but this is the perfect moment to really start marketing and remarketing at hotels. Of course, we cannot push too much on the sales part, all right? And of course, that's the macro conversion that we want. However, we build value. We always talk about value. And Sylvia and I, I mean, Sylvia, you know, that we also created a lot of content together talking about, uh, you know, uh, value as opposed to price. Everyone talks about, I mean, it's always about value, it's never about the price. It's never about the price, it's always about value. Okay, how do you value? And there is no or very little value that you can add when people have already kind of planned their vacation, their trip. I mean, they have already cleared their money in terms of when they want to go, where they want to go, which hotel potentially they want to stay. So if you start marketing at that, page, at that stage, you're probably late. 
you really need to start right now. And to do so, you really need to give people what they're looking for, to help the dreaming phase. Meaning, if you're a hotel in New York, talk about New York, because that's what people are interested in. Too. And then it will come the time where you can convert that lead into a booker. But now, that is what it is. And you need to start right now. Otherwise, it's kind of too late. There is no technology, in my opinion, that can save you from that. <laughs> that's why the technology part is a little bit of a, you know, sometimes a question. <laughs> so for sure. So let me just acknowledge a comment. Christina Quigley, I loved your comment as well. And especially the plug for Traeger Grills. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of pent up travel. And so I, I want to ask you, Sylvia, and then, and then Jonathan will ask you next. Right, right now, bookings, record low. We've all already talked about the fact that dreaming about travel, record high. Right. So I'm wondering, do you guys, do you, Sylvia, do you think that's as a result of travel restrictions? Or do you think that's Kind of the same shift that happened with news that 10 years ago we got our news online now we get our news from social you know um uh, we mentioned alessandro mentioned already it's kind of sliding more towards social and and getting in front of people more in that dreaming phase of google's customer journey but what are your thoughts is it for is it forever is it a change or do you think it's restriction pent up travel oriented and pretty soon we'll go back to the old old thing uh, I think it's actually both. So it's both social, pent up travel, but of course, the social media and the fact that we are all connected. We, we were never connected like that uh, in the pre crisis in 2008. We were not like that. So there's a lot of discussion, discussion ongoing, and uh, people are very tired right now. After more than one year of you know being at, stuck at home, they are really tired. So their willingness to travel is reaching huge, huge levels. Um, but still, as I always say, as we are all connected, uh, my mantra is, uh, and I always say to the hotels, uh, have uh, coffee and data for breakfast. Coffee because I'm Italian, of course. Uh, you need to stay ahead uh, of uh, all the information and news that are out there in order to understand what are the customers looking for if they are still in the dreaming phase, like Alessandro pointed out. What are they dreaming about? When are they willing to travel? Because only that way, by reading the data, interpreting data, travel intentions. So also for us, revenue managers, let's go out of our comfort zone. Let's dig into the marketing digital side because we need those Google information. And so let's create, let, let's be ready. Let's be ready because we're on a dreaming phase. That's the best way, that's the, the right moment where we can really show our hotels there and say, hey, I exist, come and book when you're ready, stay with me. Uh, so th that's kind of my suggestion that I give to the hoteliers. Uh, among others, of course, if you want to stay ahead of the curve, then uh, also you have to be in play integrity on price. That's what I always say. I always say you know, because only if you play integrity on price and you act granular on your strategy, if you know your market, you know your demand, you can be act granular on your strategy. You can really play on specific action, geo-targeted rates, for example, or specific action in some markets. So there are plenty of opportunities. It's just a matter of sometimes of being a little more creative than we used to be. So Jonathan, let me ask you, you see both. You see the booking engine activity, and not just the bookings, but you see the traffic. And you also are able to see the social because you monitor those. Is, are you, is, it, is it shifted to social or is it kind of, are they on the booking engine at the same time? How, how does it, like, what's happening with consumers? They're everywhere. They're, they're, we, can see, <laughs> we, can, we can see them. <laughs> we can see them. It's great. Well, I guess my mantra is, is make mistakes and grow. I think what we're doing at the moment is doing so much testing, whether it's A-B testing on, on packages and, and content, different messaging. We, we need to be able to know what is landing with our customers. And, and you can do that so easily with social media. It, it's, it's really, really simple. And there's tools out there that you can put on your own websites and booking engines that can do exactly the same thing. And that's where we can understand what's working well. We can dial that up if it is working really well. Or if it's something isn't working, then we can dial it and turn it off. And that's, that's the key, I think. The more that you can learn from that data, from the mistakes, um, and then make improvements, it is a godsend, really. I love I love that you mentioned A-B testing. For those of you that don't know what it is, look it up. It's a pretty commonly known term. But definitely, I mean, this is a time to do some stuff like that, right? And it's, even if you're looking at promoting in social, create a, create a landing page and just watch the traffic to the landing page and see if you're reaching people, if they're coming and, and, and they're they're visiting you. Uh, they're visiting you as a result of that. Uh, Alessandro, I'm, I'm actually, and really, Sylvia, you both mentioned it, and that is the price integrity thing. If you remember when I showed kind of what happens with the recoveries, there's a lagging effect, right? 
rates stay for a little while. In the case of Switzerland, they actually grow. Occupancy goes down because the people from the US don't come to ski for nine days, but Swiss people have bank. So the weekends flourish, right? So the average rate goes up. And then when all of a sudden the restrictions go away, the thing in Switzerland is, well, they, now they go back to their normal thing, which is Spain, which is Greece, which is the Maldives. It's not Verbier, right? That's where people from outside the country come. So then we see that secondary effect when things start to open back up. But then in the recovery, we see a pretty big rebound in occupancy before we see pricing power return. So how can a hotel, let's say I'm, I'm on it, right? I recognize the recovery. I'm doing a good job getting in front of people. I'm kind of, what do I do? I can't, as soon as I raise my prices, they have infinite commoditized options, as you mentioned. I can't really raise, I, I don't have pricing power yet, but I want to take advantage of the froth. What, what kind of stuff can take, what kind of stuff can folks do? So let me, I'll, I'll go back to you, Alessandro, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I kind of reconnect to what I said before in the sense that, um, I'm, I mean, it's pretty clear that I am a top of the funnel lover and I never miss opportunity to kind of mention it. Uh, but that's exactly the point when we talk about value as opposed to price. Like I said, I mean, if people, if you pretend or if you kind of try to, um, you know, raise prices, when the very first touch point that you have with a prospective customer is when he already has cleared his mind in terms of where to go, when to go and whatsoever, that probably doesn't work in the sense that the price it becomes the only decision factor, at least the most important decision factor. Instead, when you start marketing, meaning when you start a conversation, when any kind of conversation, it might be via email, social media and whatsoever with any prospective customer, and more importantly, you kind of connect or put a relationship or a, let's say a bridge between your hotel and what the ultimate reason for people to travel is, which is more likely the destination, the city, the locality. I mentioned the case before of, 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 of New York. Well, that is top of the funnel marketing, in my opinion, in the sense that, okay, you create that kind of connection. That connection happens in the mind of the prospective customer. It's not something objective. I mean, the battle in the end of the market happens in the mind of the prospective customer. When you create that, guaranteed, the price becomes less important. And when it comes to the moment of booking, the planning at the booking moment, the price, I'm not saying that it's not important, of course, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that the value in that sense goes up, a skepticism goes down, that difference, that delta is the value. I mean, if you want to put it, I mean, talking to a revenue manager, if you want to put it in numbers, that is exactly what it is. And I mean, mathematically speaking, is how you compute it. And I, I've tested it myself and it works like crazy. And I cannot testify enough by even reading, I spend a lot of time reading also what happens in other markets and it's absolutely the same. It's probably how we are wired as human beings, I guess. But it works. And this is one of probably the best way on how to raise value as opposed to price. And yeah, like I said, you have to start now. <laughs> I cannot wait too much. <laughs> Uh, and then, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you another brand question. I'm sorry, you're the brand guy. <laughs> so, but but uh, uh, let me ask you first, Sylvia. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Kind of, what do you come I, up? I would put it in a very simple and revenue management way. Yeah. So price matters when value ends. And uh, I always picture what revenue management is as the classical iceberg, where on top of the iceberg, outside of the water, there's the price, the visible part to the customer. But down underwater, there's everything which makes our job on the day-to-day -day moment, customer, uh, segmentation, right. channel. So let's start seriously working on the basis of revenue management, because only if we work wisely on that, and we finally have time to do it, to go back and look at our channel mix, the segmentations, who are our customers, how do we want to target, then our price will follow. And I assure you that you will not drop on it. That's incredible. Now you understand why Siri and I work together most of the time. Yeah, that so was, uh, the, the, <laughs> iceberg, the iceberg is an amazing analogy. And so, Jonathan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll back to you. I mean, you're in a role where you support hotels, right? And so, but I would imagine if you're in that role and you're successful, you got to guide them to the right place. You don't make them go there because making them go there doesn't work. It's like, <laughs> raising children. And so um, you kind of want to throw the bait out there and hope they go to the bait. So what kind of things are you finding that are like tendencies that you're sort of having to help people with wisdom? Guys, this is not the right approach, right? It's take a different approach. So it's take it's taking a step back and, and not trying to get to every single customer. 
understand which markets, which channels are working for you and then and focus on them. And luckily for us, as we come out of out of lockdown, certain markets will open one at a time. So we have the, the ability to focus singularly on different areas and then slowly build up the entire business, focusing then on the, the wider market. And if you can get three or four key niche markets that your hotel is, is looking at right, that's your base. Once you've got your base, it's easy to yield up from there. So really focus on those, those three or four key markets that is the customers that you really want to focus on that give you not only good room rate, but incremental revenue that are going to repeat, that are going to return, they're going to be advocates for you and drive even more business for, for you in the long term. Definitely. Yeah, that's a thank you. Um, Sylvia, I love that you said you think part of it's going to stick around. I actually think this is the result of this disruption. I think that hotels are going to get a little bit of power back. Uh, the point of sale after September 11th and all that coincided with the internet, the point of sale went from the phone. When they were, I had a reservations office, people would call me, we would qualify the customer. I mean, we did all this stuff. Then all of a sudden everything goes online and people are picking off a list. And we got commoditized, as uh, as you mentioned, Alessandro. But now, who can tell our story? Because now it's not about point of sale. It's not about who dominates the Google search results. It's about who can tell a story. Who can sell a memory, not a bed and a toilet, right? That's a really big thing. And so understanding that and speaking to your customers, even if they're not traveling yet, as you mentioned, starting to build a relationship with them. Um, I Right now, I have pent up travel. First one, California, see my kids, haven't seen them in 14 months. The second one is I have a small group of friends that live in different parts of the world and we like to travel together. We like to meet places. And so we don't know when we're going to do it. We don't have any idea. In the past, we've all aligned our vacation time. We've aligned our budget. We went online to the point of sale. We booked something and then we started researching, okay, what are we going to do when we get there? Now, all we're talking about is what we're going to do. And it's not, we don't even know there yet, but we're, but in what's happening to us, Nobody's sending links. Nobody's sending, you know, here's a possible trip. People are sharing social media posts and saying, wow, we're six couples. This thing's only seven rooms. It could just be us. Oh, that would be amazing, right? So we're, we're really spending all this time talking about travel without rates and dates yet, which is so freaky because it usually started in that process of when's dad's vacation? Where do we want to go, right? There was this very methodical process that I think is, I personally think it's, an opportunity for hotels to change that forever. And who would run my Instagram page better, me or someone sitting in London running 500 Instagram pages? So it's finally getting to where maybe it's a little bit more democratic for some hotels that that can figure out how to make it work. I, I think it's 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 actually super exciting. Um, it's you're going to have to know how to do it, or you're going to be left behind, right? Because it's still going to be in that space. But it's more. I mean, I, there's more value in the personal story. There's more value in the experience and the memory than there was or ever was before, which is to our advantage, right? It's the first thing that kind of slants back. I mean, we're never going to win the search engine optimization game, right? Because we only list one hotel on our websites. They list thousands. They have more content. But who's got more content that people want to pay attention to? It's kind of like who's going to the CNN website for the news anymore? None of us. It's all the news we like in the format we like, in the tone we like, with the spin we like, comes to our phone and that's what we consume. And I think travel has, it really has the ability to kind of evolve and and, and and become that way, right? That we really truly are selling experiences. And you mentioned also knowing if just a couple of market segments, this is your opportunity to mass personalize. If you have some great features, which is kind of a weird term, right? Mass personalization, it doesn't sound right. But if you've got some great features, assume that people that follow that stuff are interested in it and create something for them, right? That, that's interesting to them and, and cre that they can talk about. Create that buzz of us going to Greece to a seven room little kind of an inn because that sounds really cool to us. When if we'd gone on the web, we wouldn't have found that place in the first place. So that would have never been that that same process. And and so that's the that's kind of, uh, it feels like what's available to us, if you will. Okay, guys, so we're really cool discussion, first of all, <laughs> really fun. This is, I'd love to continue this over a couple of beers for a couple more hours. Um, but we're up against our time. So let me just kind of go around. And this time I'm going to start with you, Jonathan. One amazing nugget of wisdom to leave everybody with. What would be your, what's your legacy three sentences that you want to throw everybody before we move on to the next, next phase? Content, content, content. Start with your content. It's the easiest thing that you can do. It's got the most impact. And really the cost is negligible. That's something that every single hotelier can, can do right now without having to buy any new technology. Update your content. 
Absolutely true. Yeah, right. Add value. Give people things they want to see, and they'll connect with you, and they'll be your friend. And when they finally decide they want to buy something, people buy from their friends, right? So yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point. How about you, Alessandro? What would be your what would be your nugget of wisdom? Well, I kind of already connect to what Jonathan said before, in the sense that you have to allow yourself to make mistakes in a way, in the sense that uh, there is no, there is no. Well, first of all, there is no shortcut. There are no shortcuts. You have to put forth the effort to, to do the job. And why I'm saying so is uh, uh, exactly what I said before: Ray, technology. All right, technology is not that to make it our life necessarily easy, but eventually is to support us achieve the goal. And uh, having said that, also Jonathan mentioned content. And uh, that is another thing that I wanted to mention. So I'm pretty happy that he mentioned that. And therefore, I guess, uh, um, yeah, just, just uh, you know, be, how can I say, don't settle for the easy solution. Put forth the, 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 the effort to do what's need, what needs to be done. And uh, more importantly, don't just settle for being in motion, but take action. Because in my opinion, there's a big difference between the two. Um, I guess also reasonably in the sense that it's quite normal and understandable that in a situation like this, uh, people are kind of frozen from taking action. But taking action is different than being in motion. I see many hotels and many people, including myself, have been, of course, because I'm not <laughs> a noofer whatsoever. Having been in motion for too long time, this is really the time to take action, really move forward. <laughs> That's great advice. So, and Sylvia, lay one so, on us. <laughs> my last word, <laughs> real-time data, stay on top of your data and don't be afraid to change what you see happening today. Just adapt and change based on the data that you're seeing for forward-looking data, real-time data that you have today. If tomorrow data changes, be ready to change. It's totally fine, don't be afraid change and adapt. So I always quote Charles Darwin on days that said it's not the strongest of the, of the species that survives, but the one most reactive to change. <laughs> That's, that goes along with, I don't have to outswim the shark, I just have to outswim you. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 if I was, um, if I was gonna, gonna add one thing to it, I would say get on social now if you're not as a hotel, practice, go ahead and make some mistakes, it doesn't matter. If no one sees it, who cares? But understand understand the size of audiences, understand how to get in front of people, and understand how to be on social media as a business, not as a person. Hashtag amazing weekend, not a great, right? Great for my friends to see, but understand that this is a way you can get in front of people with very specific interests, and you can give them a very targeted, personalized kind of an experience in social. The other thing I would say is resist the urge to raise your prices and understand how length of stay restrictions work because you'll be able to fly under the radar screen and make more money as demand starts to come back. When there was a lot of demand, pushing people into other days didn't help us as much. Now we have peaks and valleys again, big time. And so as you start to filter your demand, try to learn how to filter it by pattern, not by willingness to pay, because you're not changing your value proposition with your customers. You're not raising your relative price compared to others, but you're getting the best stays out of all of it. So if you've never learned like the stay restrictions, if you've never used them in the past, I understand why, but this is when things start to recover, a much better tool in terms of your customer's tolerance than raising the price on them. Boy, let them, we don't have pricing power for a while, so learn how to make more money other ways. Um, Enzo, I don't know if you hey. have any questions or anything for us. Um, I, 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 can. I expected a lot and they delivered a really, really, uh, I mean, a really, really good bunch that we put together. I think some really cool insights for people as we as we go forward. So. Yeah, definitely. You did a great job, guys. I mean, I see people commenting and getting, you know, interaction each other like a crazy. So first of all, let me thank all the audience because they're really uh, feeling the conversation. They will feel like part of that. So I, I wanted to try to reply some of the comments, but it's really going on so crazy. Um, just in case, guys, after the episode, as you know, this is going to be uh, on demand available on LinkedIn on also YouTube. If you have time, maybe Jonathan, Sylvia, Alessandro, you also, Scott, going through the, the comments maybe later tonight or tomorrow and trying to reply some of the comments from you. Yeah. That would be great. Um, so cool. Very nice. So now, as you know, guys, we're ending this panel. Now we start the vendor track session. We have three great companies, Roomdex, and then we have um, Room Cloud 
edited one of them, guys. So anyway, so we got those three <laughs> other presentations. Uh, it's going to be like an elevator pitch presentation. And at the end of the presentation, our guests, our panelists, they will going to make some questions to put them in an uncomfortable zone. Make sure, guys, you have a very hard question. So thank you again. Uh, Actually, Enzo, if you, don't, if you don't mind, let me share a little anecdote about technology. Definitely look at this new stuff. There's really, really cool stuff now if you have not looked at new technology in your hotelier. Um, and there, I recently looked at one. I mean, I'll give them a mini commercial. OTA Insights recently added a forward-looking product called Market Insight. Yeah. I was working with some hotels. <laughs> we saw a surge in demand three months in the future. <clears throat> and this was for some Florida hotels. We were able, this was in January, we were able to drill down into that. And it was really all coming from New York State. And with a little more research, they figured out that it was the New York State school break schedule and people were planning to come to Florida. So they surfaced the opportunity 10 weeks in advance and they were able to deploy marketing against it. In the past, we typically found out about that stuff and we told ourselves, don't forget about next year's school break. But we never really had the ability to see it before it had taken place. So it's a lot of really cool forward looking stuff out there. Make sure you check out the technology because some of it's amazing. So. Yeah, definitely. Right. So before we start with the first session, I uh, just wanted to share with you um, a little uh, advice. As you know, some of you know, me and Scott, we are part of HSMI, um, a very big and international association. We are very good friends with Ingen, Benedicta, Marius. I say hello to everyone uh, at the association. Um, they are also organizing a very interesting uh, live streaming series around revenue distribution, digital marketing. So I'm going to share quickly a um, short video just to introduce what is going to be the plan of HSMI that we go back and start the vendor track session. <laughs> 